All right, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, we are still waiting for uh, one of our panelists, uh, but we will go ahead and uh, get started. Um, welcome uh, to the Empire uh, series lecture on um, the pathways to uh, surgeon scientists. That's where that's where our topic is today. Um, it's part of our hidden curriculum webinar series. Um, one of two lectures this week. Um, and um, the goal of this uh, session is basically to kind of go over uh, the motivations of why somebody would pursue uh, this career path, um, how someone goes about doing that, um, what the process looks like, and then uh, the day-to-day -day activities of uh, being a surgeon scientist. Um, once again, if you have any uh, questions, put them in the uh, Q&A in the chat box, um, and then we will go over them. Uh, and then quickly to go over all of our uh, faculty and speakers today. Um, as our moderator today, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Christopher Barbieri, uh, who's an MD, PhD. Uh, he's an associate professor of urology at uh, Cornell. Um, and uh, he was fellowship trained in urologic oncology. Uh, we have Dr. Lenore Ackerman, uh, who's also an MD, PhD. She is uh, an assistant professor um, and director of research at uh, UCLA. And uh, she's fellowship trained in um, FPMRS. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Eric Kaufman, uh, who is an assistant professor of uh, urology at uh, Roswell Park uh, in Buffalo. And uh, he's also fellowship trained in urologic oncology. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Sikianos uh, uh, at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. And uh, he's, an, he's an assistant professor of urology there and uh, He's also fellowship trained in neurologic oncology. And uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Ari uh, Hakimi, uh, who's an assistant professor of urology at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, he was also uh, fellowship trained in neuro neurologic oncology. And uh, with that, I will uh, show the CME uh, slide here that uh, we have to show you. So once again, this uh, lecture is CME, uh, uh, provides CME. So, uh, please fill out the survey at the uh, end of the session to uh, get your senior credit, and um, we will uh, give, give that to you after that's over, and also look out for an email uh, from Michelle pa Paoli uh, after the session for that as well. So with that, I will uh, hand the floor over to Dr. Barbieri. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introductions. Uh, thanks to all the organizers uh, and you guys that have been running the Empire Urology Curriculum. Uh, it's been a fantastic program that I think helped a lot of the, the trainees and other people in urology really uh, get some insight into um, some different backgrounds and some some different educational opportunities. So tonight we want to talk about, um, you know, the, the goal and the uh, job of being a surgeon scientist, basically. Uh, I'm very thankful to be joined by uh, several very uh, excellent surgeon scientists in urology. Um, you know, we're all uh, not that far out of training, but far enough out of training to have a little bit of insights into, I think, what got us into these jobs or, or where we are now. So hopefully we're able to, to talk through that and, uh, and to convey that to the, uh, the listeners. Um, so just to sort of uh, jump right in, um, you know, Dr. Ackerman, uh, you know, you've had a, a interesting path to kind of get to the job you're in. Kind of talk talk us through a little bit about your career path and and really like what were some of like the critical decisions you felt like you had that kind of put you uh, on this course that you're on. Awesome. Okay, so I am a little odd in the whole. Um, uh, physician scientist kind of pathway because I actually did my graduate work before deciding to go to medical school. And for me, that was a, I had originally uh, gone to graduate school because I knew I really wanted to do research, um, but I didn't realize the value of being able to do translational research and the value of, that the clinical training would have in being able to do that research well. And so I ended up taking the, the super long road <laughs> to, to uh, being a physician scientist by kind of doing each of those training independently. Um, and I think that what that allows me to sort of speak to is the value of dedicated time to do um, research training. 
Uh, and I think there's a huge value in that. I think because I did my graduate work before coming to medicine, I, I just I, had a different perspective on, um, on kind of how I approach clinical problems even during my medical training. And so I think there's really a lot of value in having some dedicated time for that, whether it's a year as part of your residency or time in fellowship or time doing a, a graduate, a, you know, a real a graduate degree. Um, in, in all those contexts, having the opportunity to spend some real time learning how to do research, not doing research, but learning really how to do it. And whether that's a structured program where you're working in a project and through a project with a mentor or you're actually taking classes, I I think both of those are valuable, but I think it's much more critical to learn, you know, how to structure an experiment, whether that's at the bench or whether that's a clinical question, understanding how to control for confounding variables, understanding how to how to make sure that the question that you're that you're asking is really going to answer the question you're trying to ask. And I think all of those things are, are something that it's hard to pick up on the fly by just trying to work through a project every third afternoon that you might have off of clinical responsibilities. And so I think there's a huge value in having some dedicated research time. I would not necessarily recommend that everybody go and do a PhD that's completely separate from any other program. That seemed like a little less useful time than maybe everybody needs, but um, but I think there is a lot of value in that. And then once um, I sort of got into medical school and got onto a more clinical track, um, uh, I did go to a residency program that had a dedicated year of research. There aren't that many of those around anymore, but I think it's some, I think that was a a, a great a, a uh, opportunity, and it also was helpful to have um, you know a, additional. Uh, sort of opportunity to take a step back and say, how do I really want my life as an attending to look And that time during residency made it possible to kind of do that? You know, I think that once I graduated from fellowship, um, the, the next sort of real big critical decision was what kind of research life I want to have. And I think, you know, unless you're one of these people who's really, really on on focus and has that perfect sort of fellowship op opportunity or, or residency opportunity where you've been developing a project and it's clear between you and the, the PI you've been working with that you're going to take this project and develop it further. Most of us don't end up in that perfect situation where the data is already ready to go and that project is something we can take for ourselves and move on with. I think that, you know, I kind of started in my first faculty position knowing kind of generally what I might want to do, um, but needing to have the support in a good environment in which I could explore a bunch of different things and then finally begin to start to narrow my focus onto what I was really finding was working and finding was fulfilling and finding was something that I could support in terms of a research program. And so having that next critical, and this is, I think, probably the most critical decision you make is, is finding a place where you have a supportive administration and a chairman and other sort of infrastructural um, resources that can allow you to kind of expend some resources early on before you've had the opportunity to, to develop a program to be able to find your way and find your path. And then it, you can get funding and, and move on from there. But that early support with the, with the understanding that you're going to need some time and that that may not pay off in that first six months like a, somebody who's got a real rational understanding of how much how much effort research takes and how much time things take to to get to fruition, that I think is the most critical thing decision I faced is, is finding that first that first job to get you on on the right path. Just to uh, to follow up on one of those, so um, Dr. Kaufman, you know, uh, Dr. Ackerman kind of highlighted that she was actually in a research career first, and then kind of what decided to go back into medicine. Was that similar for you, or was that sort of a, a different path for you? Um, it was a little, little different, but with, with some overlap. So I I actually uh, like in college was kind of ecology, animal stuff, uh, 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 kind of uh, directed. And then uh, just kind of personal, my family, there's uh, my dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer and it kind of just introduced me to that whole area. I never really liked lab stuff until that summer um, when I did some research. So I kind of changed my whole track at the end of college. But when I went into med school, I, I knew it's what I wanted to do. And I thought about the PhD. I was told by enough people that you didn't need to do it anymore. Um, sorry, <laughs> I guess you might've wanted to talk to those people too. Um, 
but uh, no, but I tried, you know, I knew it was going to be a, a tough road. And I think this is a kind of where all, whether it's med school or residency, if you're trying to do research, you have to supplement your training like at every step possible. So I did like a Howard Hughes fellowship during med school. I was lucky I did that. But I also just e even on the years where I wasn't in the fellowship, I was doing lab research on top of it. And in a residency, really my first few years, I didn't do anything. I mean, internship and two years of general surgery, then our uh, first year in urology, I, I really didn't do lab stuff, but I was still doing academic stuff, trying to get a, a couple papers out. But the last three years of, of residency, I did um, uh, lab stuff on top, you know, all the time, just whenever I could squeeze it in. And uh, I, th I think, you know, and having dedicated year on the fourth year was, was huge. If you can find a residency program that still does that. And then, if, then the fellowship program that was, uh, you know, really uh, at the NCI has a good lab research focus. So the key theme there is, um, no, I was all medical, but I supplemented with lab stuff as much as I could along the way. Got it. Well, yeah. Uh, so Dr. Spacchiano is kind of a sim along a similar vein, like, you know, when did you kind of realize that the kind of job you have now was kind of the job you wanted and, and, you know, were you preparing for it all along or was it sort of a series of, you know, fortunate steps and serendipity that kind of knocked you into where you're going? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for me, like my serendipity step was actually as a first year college student, you know, and just walking through the hallways saw like a little posting for, you know, summer research assistant you know, and um, I said, hey, let me give this a shot. And it was actually in an HIV lab. Um, and from there, I just kind of fell in love with bench work and, you know, and, you know, sort of a, um, doing, I, I knew after really that summer, I wanted to incorporate research in my career somehow or another. And then from there, I actually um, applied and got accepted into a linkage program. Um, I actually went to college in New York City at Hunter and the program was with Cornell. I was in a hemonc lab for three years, you know, doing animal work and bench work and so forth. Um, and I really wanted to do an MD PhD, but clearly not as smart as the other MD PhDs in this panel. So um, just just did an MD path and, and at some new knowing that I wanted to uh, do research just throughout my MD, I would just, you know, make sure that I was invested in some type of research, always learning a new technique or, um, you know, trying to figure out what, what exactly I wanted my career to look like in terms of the research protocol. So. so you were, it sounds like you were pretty purposeful the whole way of wanting to head towards a research career. Was, was urology kind of a part of that sort of purposeful direction or yeah. again, was, dumb luck? No, um, I actually wanted to do PT mock in med school. Um, so I did uh, you know, I did a bunch of pediatrics type stuff, and then I um, went to medical school in Buffalo. So at Roswell Park, I actually worked with the, uh, a, a pediatric oncologist after classes in, in their lab doing a variety of different things. And, you know, really had an interest in, uh, in PT Monk. And then I always tell the story to my residents, like, you know, I, I had, we, we were forced to do a urology rotation uh, during uh, medical school, uh, we all had to spend one week. And then during my first day, I show up to where I'm supposed to be. Nobody's there. I'm waiting five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Nobody shows up. And, you know, from the back of the room, I hear something. So I walk to the back and it's my chief resident and the attending playing FIFA soccer in his office before rounds. Uh, and I was like, this is interesting. And, and you know, that kind of initially grabbed me, but the, you know, the aspects of urology that I love is exactly what we talk about, the ability to do um, a variety of different um, clinical, you know, sort of small procedures, large procedures, um, you know, oncology, all the other sort of specialties, but also very heavily research oriented where you have avenues to be able to do research, still be a surgeon and then pick a, a specialty that you would enjoy. So um, that's how I got into urology. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like clearly there's, I mean, as the several of us have sort of talked through, there, there's more than one way to get to sort of the kind of role and kind of surgeon scientist position you've had. So Dr. Hakimi, I'll, I'll sort of, you know, along the way in terms of, you know, your training, 
like, you know, doing research during residency, doing research and fellowship, like where did, was there one that you felt like was like the critical time to really concentrate on your research, to really get you going and to kind of get your career going? Or do you think it sort of uh, was a toss up basically? Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so thanks Chris for doing this, by the way. Um, so the, uh, for me, I, you know, I had a, I went to a very kind of, I would say blue collar residency program at, at Montefiore Einstein, which was a great program, but it was, it was very much, you know, clinical focused and we didn't have a dedicated research here. I did, you know, clinical research like everyone else tries to do. But I had, um, when I did my, my, the Memorial Fellowship, we had two, uh, mandatory two years of research. And, you know, initially I was a little annoyed by that. It was actually a deterrent for me. But then I decided in my fifth year of residency that I wanted to do kind of more translational research. So it ended up being a total uh, career changer for me because it allowed me to have two years to do uh, kind of more fundamental research, which is, you know, a lot of the most SUO fellowships are really one in one and you can get stuff done, but it's hard a lot to, if you don't come in with a lot of skills or a lot of knowledge uh, to, uh, to make a lot of progress during that time. So for me, it was just fortuitous. I uh, trained during the time of the TCGA, uh, which was also totally fortuitous for me. So uh, I got involved in the you know fundamental TCGA work pretty early. So a lot of it is like serendipity in terms of timing, uh, and then having the dedicated two years of time with that was totally protected allowed me to um, just kind of immerse myself in that world, and ultimately led to me uh, getting the job I wanted uh, with kind of protected time. So a lot of it is really is really luck, but I would say that the skills that I learned in residency and my desire to work uh, to do research really motivated my ability to kind of succeed in different environments. Um, so, you know, I think if you're capable of collaborating, capable of being motivated and getting work done, uh, whether it's clinical research or whether it's more basic science or translational, all those skills will carry forward and just help you um, no matter what field you go into. So I think there's you know, a lot to be said for just kind of the hustle and drive. Certainly, I think that's what made, has made a lot of us successful uh, that, still try to operate and in, 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 in work in, in clinical worlds is you have to be able to be flexible and uh, kind of figure out how to make things work in, in, let, in circumstances that are a bit more challenging than the typical researcher. Yeah, no, and just to, to you know, follow up on that, I think like it's important for our urology trainees to hear, or med students to hear too, that like, you know, you don't have to have an MD PhD to end up in a career where you're doing a lot of research and like maybe the majority of your time doing research. You don't have to like go to a residency where you get to have a year of dedicated research, you know, in some way, like there's, you know, at any sort of point in the track, you know, it's never too late basically to be like, yeah, okay, I really like this research. I'm gonna keep doing it basically. Um, and, you know, I think that's the way you describe that example of you sort of picking everything up in fellowship and having it take off is sort of example. You're one of the most successful surgeon scientists in urology now. So it's, again, it's like, not like you have to have all the groundwork laid for you, like perfectly set up for things to fall into place. Well, definitely. And well, yeah. also that, Chris, I just, I think one, one very important point that you mentioned here in, in this, all the panelists have sort of mentioned one year is not going to get you anything. One year is barely enough to sort of scratch the surface in sort of the thought process of how to be a scientist. Forget about the actual technical trainings and, you know, sort of understanding and learning all the different techniques that you would need. So if you're, I mean, I think there was a question in the chat about recommend residencies that, you know, have like a one year of, of, uh, of research, but that's just not enough. If you really want that you need to make it a part of your life, a part of your career, a part of training by doing seminars, talking to people, taking time off, starting early, continuing, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, just to echo, because you're you, you, not to deflate the point you made, but it sounds like uh, you, know, you, you, you don't want to just uh, rely completely on that year. But yeah, if, if you don't have anything prior to that, um, if you fall into something where, where people have done a lot of research and you can kind of capitalize on their productivity and get some papers out. But I think all of us here on this panel have multiple dedicated years prior to their faculty position, um, yeah. maybe even prior to, to fellowship. Um, 
So the bottom line is you, you need some currency when you're going out to that job to say that um, not only am I interested in this, I will be successful. And you can't, you need something, currency has either got to be publications or grants or some kind of honor awards uh, in the research field. Yeah, and I would say also, um, Eric, just to piggyback on that, I mean, besides those critical components, it's also having the right early mentors. So for me personally, I was very fortunate, very fortunate to have really good kind of clinically minded mentors. So all my mentors were either MDs or MD PhDs. So they, except for one, but that was later on in my career. And, um, and they were all very, very good about not only helping me write the grants, but also just like helping me deal with like the challenges that come about being trying to being a clinician researcher. And when you're trying to apply for some of the career development awards, one of the most fundamental uh, facts that they ask for, or they look for is kind of who is your mentor and what is their track record? Because most of us, most of the people that write career development awards are just really starting out. So there's not necessarily, unless you're a PhD or MD PhD, you don't have that big paper necessarily. But if you have a really good mentor who's proven him or herself, um, you know, then that can really be a big game changer for you. So I think mentorship, like in any aspect of our field, but it's particularly pertinent for people that are trying to start off getting that right um, enter, uh, you know, the first job or because it, it just helps in so many ways and then continuing those relationships and of course trying to pay it forward down the road. Yeah, to, to follow up on that, I'm going to ask Dr. Ackerman, like, you know, you mentioned, you know, your mentorship in your initial faculty job, how important that is, you know, so what, what were you sort of looking for before, you know, when you were a fellow kind of looking for, like, what were you looking for in a mentor? And what do you know now in retrospect that you might look for something a little bit different? And I think we can all, we can kind of go around because I think this mentorship topic is arguably the most important one that we have to talk about. Um, the only thing I would say is that the, probably the key is, one of the key things to realize is you probably need more than one person that offers you different things at different times, certainly. Yeah, I mean, I think that that the biggest thing for me was to look for a department with a track record of supporting investigators. And I think that was the that's an unfortunate truth. But but you start to notice that that NIH funding, for example, tends to cluster at certain institutions. And if you're really interested in being sort of a, a serious physician scientist, there's probably a reason that goes beyond just those people in that you know, you have infrastructural support in terms of grant submissions and you have uh, core facilities that can can facilitate research when you so you don't have to do everything yourself. And also, if there are other people in your department, in, in your prospective department that are making that career as a physician scientist work, then obviously the institution is doing something right to support those people. And so having that sort of track record, you know, for me, when I was doing you know, looking at my first position, I picked a chairman for my visit, like a, I picked a chairman who was an R1 holding physician scientist. And that meant a lot to me that I knew he, and he did basic science. So I knew he knew what it was like. Um, and that was hugely important to me. And there were other people at that institution who were young investigators who had gone on to get K awards. And I was like, okay, that's a good hallmark to me that there are people around and that the institution itself is gonna be supportive of that. Part of that being, you know, just there's always this struggle between, you know, you know, having your research time protected well enough to be able to 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 make progress and and being clinically productive. And and uh, there are a lot of people who pay lip service to the idea that they want you to be a scientist, but they don't know what that means. And so that track record was super important to me. And the other part that I'll say is just. You have to find a good mentor. I mean, for me, my primary mentor was a PhD who did not understand my clinical life at all. And he's wonderful. He's still my mentor, even though I've gone on to switch institutions. Um, but he wasn't, he's not enough. And he will be the first to admit that he's perfect as a, as a mentor to help me through my, my, my lab experiments. But I needed a clinical mentor. And I frankly, and you need a, like a life mentor. You know, you need that person who's not directly involved in your science that you can go to and say, I don't know what to do with my lab manager they don't do what I tell you know like and you just got to figure that stuff out like and so having a bunch of different people available who can fill those roles for you is 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 important and I think that that happen it's easier for that to happen it's at institutions where there's a, a greater depth of research uh, or 
um, and just people involved. And they don't all have to come from inside your institution. You can find those people other places, but you got to have them. So if you can't find it there, you got to have a plan for having those people in place other places. Other thoughts on that, on sort of like finding mentors, what skills you're looking for in a mentor or how to how to vet a mentor? So I think, um, I mean, I'll hopefully, uh, so how should I put this? I'll play the opposite role um, a little bit because it's important to sort of hear that yes, mentors are great, uh, but there is also this idea of be, uh, be cautious from the standpoint that, you know, cause some, you know, some mentors, um, you know, may, not necessarily be have the time to be as involved, or not that they mean harm, but there's there's always this sort of issue that if you depend too much on a mentor or mentors, um, sometimes you can get more distracted than you can um, actually benefit from them. Um, I loved all my mentors; they were they great. Um, I think my most productive mentors have now been those at my faculty position um, because um, I think. I've been able to find like-minded individuals who now become my mentors, but also become my co-PIs on my grants or my, you know, co-PIs on the experiments and, and you know, so forth and so on. Um, so finding a mentor is really important. Finding many mentors, I think, is even more important. And each mentor has their own sort of skill set in terms of how they can help you and guide you for what you would like out of a career. So, like. There's not one size fits all. I don't think you can have just one mentor and always go to that mentor for all the clinical scientific life, um, you know, issues that come about and that you need guidance on. And, and it's really important to sort of understand the, the differences and find people that can help guide you through through the different sort of issues that arise um, from all the different aspects of a career. Yeah, and I would add, um, I think those are all excellent points that were made. Um, you know, it's really important to try to find, if it's possible, a surgeon scientist mentor on some level. And it does, definitely does not have to be in urology because um, what you will in, undoubtedly encounter is people just telling you that you can't pull this off, especially in surgery. Um, you know, there's a lot of, in general, both from the research side and the clinical side, there's a lot of uh, a, a general conception that surgeons don't do real science or surgeons don't do real research. Uh, unless it's, you know, outcomes or, you know, uh, database mining. And obviously, that's obviously not true, but it's very discouraging and it can be very, um, it can be, it can kill your, your drive, honestly. And, uh, and especially if you have the normal failures or lack of funding or uh, rejections from papers or grants, which is completely normal and expected and happens to even the most funded researchers on the planet. Um, but it's, it's particularly hard when you're, when you're trying to pull off this career as a surgeon. So if you're at a place where there's a guy in biliary or a woman in colorectal or a breast surgeon or something like that, that uh, is able to pull it off. I spent a lot of time actually as a fellow talking to people in other areas that were doing what I thought was cool and they were surgeons. And I found a lot of different tricks from that. And some of them became like ongoing mentors. And at, at Sloan, we're fortunate where we have like a surgeon's work in progress meeting where we meet, you know, periodically, which is very helpful. But even finding a couple of those people that will encourage you and, and you can kind of commiserate with this constant feeling of I can't, I'm not adequate at either thing that I do, whether it's surgery or whether it's uh, research, because you're constantly being pulled in different directions. I think that's, to me, was one of the most important um, parts of, of, of feeling I could do this. And Having peers is really helpful. I know I see Chris a lot and we're able to talk about things periodically. And certainly John and I are very close friends and we've been able to kind of uh, talk about, you know, the challenges of doing this. But having those, those peer mentors and then senior mentors are all critical, but having someone that's a surgeon scientist, if you can find it, is really, really helpful and will really help you kind of um, meet a lot of the challenges that are inevitably you will encounter. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I think, you know, one of one of the soapboxes I definitely get on is I, I heard consistently coming out of graduate school, you know, get finishing medical school, like what clinical career I was going to choose. I definitely heard the message consistently that don't even think about a surgical field if you want to be serious about doing research, basically. Like it's a, it was a consistent message I heard. It pissed me off, quite frankly, and it still pisses me off to this day because I think it's wrong. I think it's like, 
like you said, it's killing the drive of, of like, you know, uh, younger trainees who are, it's keeping people from going into fantastic fields that are surgical because they want to have a research career and they think they can't do it. So I, I think that's one of the reasons people like us need to keep doing stuff like this to sort of pay it forward and, and make it clear that this is a doable job that we can be quite successful at. And, you know, it can be very fun to have um, that balance between clinical and sort of research time. And especially when you can have research projects where you can clearly see your clinical endeavor feeding your research or your research kind of feeding and helping out your patients. It's really rewarding, 100%. Chris, the only thing I wanted, I, I would add to that is um, that one, I realized I clicked on the wrong link. So my name is Chris Barriari as well, but if only- it's A little if, disconcerting, but it's cool. it's cool. If, if only I could be as good looking as you, Chris. <laughs> uh, but, you know, one of the things from, from the comments that you, you made was that I think that, you know, to be very honest, I think one of the things that you, whoever's listening to this from students to residents, that you need to understand that if this is what you want to do, and this is your career and your dream, you need to realize that this is your path, your dream, your goal, and then leave all the outside noise as outside noise. So you cannot, if you become a faculty person, a member of a department that has a really busy surgeon, that really busy surgeon is probably going to get some priorities over you when it comes to certain clinical things or, or even financial or you know, ancillary support staff, et cetera, et cetera. And there is this sort of jealousy, sort of ego thing that can happen. It, it, it definitely happened to me when I first started, you know, Leah, like, why can't I have that? Well, I can't have that because I need to balance between clinical and research and actually do what I enjoy doing, which is my research um, and, and what I want my career path to come out through. And eventually you catch up because everything falls in place, your research falls in place, your clinical falls in place, and you are sort of that, you know, you, you are a figure in, in that department as well, but you don't get to that point as quickly as those who are clinically busy. And so, you, you know, one thing to sort of come, that I like to come across is that you will get there. It just takes a little longer and you should not be discouraged about what's happening around you and that you may not have priority for certain things in your clinical or your research uh, practice, but if you just keep to your your goals, your guns, what you're really interested in, and continue it, you will get to that point. Um, just may take a year or two more than you know your colleagues who are just clinical. Yeah, to so follow up on that, Kaufman, any any thoughts about sort of how to balance that clinical versus research, the the time, the responsibilities, the 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 rewards that are given for for you know, the two things can be very different. Yeah, for sure. Um, I do want to just echo before I answer that, the, the importance of mentorship, not to like uh, beat a dead horse, but I, I kind of, my, my long course to, to get a first grant went through many problems and just challenges with, with mentors. And I, I chose my institute because our chair had that, that, uh, vision that Dr. Ackerman was, was talking about. He's a surgeon scientist with the track record in, uh, of, of uh, science success. And I knew he would be supportive. And he's been that, um, that surgeon scientist that Ari was, was recommending you, you, you have as kind of a mentor. But for a more laboratory mentor to compliment him, I just went through so many people. When I finally found one, uh, he left. He told me he was leaving like right before I was submitting my K grant. And it was just kind of one thing after another with finding a good fit. So I would just tell anyone who's, who's interested, that should really be part of your uh, interview process when you're looking at these places, not just the vision of the department and the chairperson, but who, who, who's going to be my mentor. That shouldn't be something you try to figure out after your arrival. You may have to, but you'll have a leg up if you already have that sorted out. And then I'll just add the, the mentors who these grants go to are big name mentors at, you know, bigger institutes. It's just, just how it is, but uh, it doesn't preclude you from kind of building a competitive application with a mentor who may be a, a small name and unknown in the field. And the key there is you, you have to start an early track record where you show like publications together um, as, as for example, a, a way to boost your application. Anyway, 
back to your question of the time, um, I think it depends what kind of uh, where your research is. So mine be more laboratory. I think you need more more dedicated research time. Um, with uh, straight clinical outcomes, perhaps you wouldn't, but I won't speak to that because it's not really my area. Um, I, I like to aim for like a 50-50 or even a 60-40 research clinical, but my advice will be, uh, and I'm curious to hear the other panelists, I think they'll probably agree, you, you're, you're going to be pushed more clinical always from what you have. And uh, as uh, John kind of hinted, that may be valued more even by an academic chairman with scientific vision. They still may value the clinic because no matter how much you're pulling in with grants, it's probably not as much as you'd be pulling in with, uh, you know, doing more surgeries. So you really have to push for more research time from the start ask for more than you think you'll need because you can always do clinical stuff on your research time, but you can't do research stuff on, on your clinical time. And, uh, you, and you can always ask for more dedicated clinical time, but you, it's going to be hard to ask for more re dedicated research time. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree that, you know, early on take more and, you know, that, that you will likely have to give back at some point, um, you know, in terms of research time, but the more you can secure early, the better it is, um, for for sure. I'm totally in agreement. With that. That's like one of the rules. I think I try to teach all like the sort of residents and folks who come to me for mentorship. Yeah, and, and I would say that if you're going to be negotiating a contract, you want that in writing. I mean, if you can um, have a you know your your split and also ideally some sort of startup funding because the first three years or so are probably the most critical in terms of preliminary data and uh, the ability to, uh, uh, to um, compete for some of the career development awards. And there's a lot of them out there, whether it's through the DOD, which has recently funded a lot of the urologic malignancies now, kidney for sure, bladder and prostate. Uh, or the, just that, yeah. <laughs> Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. <laughs> yeah. They fund yeah. benign stuff too. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, and, and so, uh, there's a lot of, like that's probably the most important time for your for your setting your foundation, and so you really want to have protected time and ideally some startup funding. I got a very modest startup at Memorial when I started, but it was certainly enough. And I had um, I had got some philanthropy actually from patients. Just sometimes that randomly will help, and that is really uh, critical. And that's one thing that surgeons have. That's why institutions always love surgeons because we bring in a lot of philanthropy money also. Um, but that can be used to help fund your kind of critical. And you have to make a lot of smart decisions about what you fund and not being too broad. And sometimes you might have something that you really love, but the other thing is more fundable. So you might make some strategic decisions early on to just get that momentum going. Um, so that's where mentorship is also is really helpful also. Like what do I have to in my interest and in my preliminary data that is most fundable and how can I develop that a little bit more? And you learn some of those skills early on but having some you know, financial backing early to help you do that is good because most people don't come out of fellowship with a grant. I mean, occasionally you'll be one of those lucky fellows that gets an AUA grant or something else or a ASCO YA, but those are relatively modest amounts of money. Um, so you really want to get a, ideally a, a, a position where you have you know, X amount of money per year for a startup. So yeah, along those lines, um, Lenny, what other resources would you say you really need to focus on and sort of negotiate for as like, you know, getting going? Um, you know, we kind of mentioned protected time. I mean, one thing I will mention is for everyone to sort of think through what that protected time really means and how it's protected, because, you know, there are certain institutions where things operate like a private practice and you, uh, if the answer is, well, yeah, you have four days a week of protected time, you're like, well, who writes prescriptions and answers the phones if on my protected time? They're like, well, nobody. So like, the, these are the kind of things, sometimes you need to like think through that entire process of what, what do you really need to protect your time all the way? Yeah, and it's hard. I mean, you can, you can kind of negotiate for these in a couple different ways, but you are, you know, it, it, a lot of it's going to depend on the individual situation. Like if you have the, uh, you found a mentor who's got a space for you in the lab and they have made the commitment to you that they're going to provide you with certain resources and services that really does help uh, reduce what you're going to need in terms of money. But basically time isn't really just time. Time is, and it's not just protection, but it's also 
people and infrastructure too. And so, you know, if you can't, you know, you can compensate for things with money, sadly. So if you say have 50% time, you think you need 75, but they're going to give you a bunch of money, then you can use things like core services or commercial services to fill in some of the gaps that you may not be able to, uh, to do by being at the bench yourself. So, you know, my projects are, uh, heavily dependent on microbiome analyses, which is very sequencing dependent. And I can do this by making my own libraries and doing my own sequencing uh, and my own data interpretation, or I can send it to a company for a fee and they can do all that for me. And I think that was one of the things that, you know, um, I was also told early on was don't hoard your money because what are you saving it for? You really need the the expenditure early on, uh, as we were talking about, to, to get that preliminary data so you can get the grant so that you can keep spending money, which is, you know, if you if you save it and then you don't have any data, you can't make it to that next point. So, um, so that's I think you're kind of you're never going to get everything on your wish list, but you need either people, time, or money to make things work, and and there's got to be a balance in there. So you need some of your own time, but you're never going to do. You know, one of the hard parts about all this is that you're kind of expected to achieve the same amount as somebody who's a full time researcher, and. And it's very hard, even if you kind of can let yourself realize that that's not really possible, those metrics that are put out there for how people achieve in science don't change because you spend half of your time doing clinical work. And so how do you fill in that missing piece and you do that with time or, or with more people or more money and frankly, the two add up to the same thing really. And whichever, so if they say, well, your startup is only gonna be this much money, then you say, hey, can you at least support a lab technician for such, such and such a time? There are ways to kind of make this work so that you can have those people to delegate or as as we were saying if, if it's really the well we can't give you any more time or money then you can say okay but three days a week the nurses are going to answer the phones and respond to all my clinical messages that you just have to find a way to get something off your plate by delegating it to other people and and i think that's 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 the hard part is finding right that right balance that works for that institution but if they're if you're going to be answering you know 20 patient emails and 13 patient calls a day, that's hours of time that you're not spending doing your research. And so you have to, to account for that and, and think about all of those details. If you don't have administrative support, you're going to be making all your own travel. You're going to be scheduling your meetings and that's going to be extra time. And so I think you need time and money and people uh, and they can compensate for each other in different ways, but you got to think about having all of those things in place, not just your own time. Add to, I think, all those really great points. I think the most important thing for an early researcher is to stay focused, is not to try to, you know, sort of change what you're doing because there's a hot something that you read that somebody else published and you think that's what, you know, that's what's going to happen. You, you really need to sort of really hone in, especially at the beginning of what your hypothesis is, what your research project is, and really try to get the data for that. And don't be sort of sidetracked by what you read, who you work with, who's doing something, who publishes, who got the grant, et cetera, et cetera. Just stay focused. That'll allow you to sort of be able to budget whatever philanthropic or whatever startup money you have. It allows you to sort of then really hone in and get the support from the people that can really help you and you build stronger relationships that way. They, you know, you don't want to have, you know, to, to be too sporadic. So I think that's one of the key important mistakes I made that, um, I corrected thankfully early, and now I'm sort of, you know, on, on track to, to continue. Was that scientific lack of focus that you were worried about, or or clinical lack of focus? Because I could see you could you could see it both ways, hurting you to some extent. Yeah, I was I was speaking mostly for the uh, the research lack of focus, but I do think clinical uh, lack of focus is also, um, you know, something that can happen and. and Going back to sort of one of the earlier points I made is when you when you have sort of people that are around you that are clinically really busy doing a lot of different things, um, they they can do that because they're sort of operating all the time. They're they're clinically busy, so they can you know they see all that different volume. But if you're a researcher who's dedicated to sort of research, um, and then clinically you're trying to be a very clinically busy, and you don't have you lack focus, and you're not gonna you're not gonna do things well. So um, I, I think for a surgeon scientists, it's always better to be clinically focused and research focused. And those two fo focuses really, um, you know, sort of work with each other and 
you know intertwined with each other so yeah i would i would totally agree with john there um you know it's and sometimes this is hard i mean it really depends on the institution about how like for me, my my work and my clinical are totally tied together. I, I just see kidney cancer patients and I my research is just kidney cancer focused, but it's very hard to get that focus. But I would say that I I built I built both up slowly and you know and with a lot of um, kind of thought about how to do it. And I, I, I had the same pitfall that John had early on where I was sort of too diffuse uh, in what I was doing. I had a lot of things that interest me in my research and that's great if you're trying to do kind of superficial research, but if you're trying to get funded, you need to be super focused on some question that has a testable hypothesis with an answer that you can address. And uh, the more you're, you, you kind of write these fishing expeditions grants, the more painful you'll, you'll find it is. I'm uh, just getting a lot of rejections. And I, I mean, part of it was learning process and just getting the feedback on the grants and learning how to write it properly. But then it was also mentorship and some of, some of the mentors are more engaged than others in how you write your grant. You ideally want to find someone that's going to really sit down and scrutinize your grant and then and kill it and then you rebuild it. Um, but uh, as focused as you possibly can in both, in both respects is really good. And again, if you're in a situation where you're surgically being asked to do complex things, you either punt them or you do them with a senior surgeon and you put your ego aside because the last thing you want is, is major complications, which is really going to set you back from everything you do. Because obviously the patients are always going to come first in your research or your clinical world. And if you're tackling things clinically that are above your head or are taking up a lot of your time, it's going to stress you out and it's going to make you uh, not accomplish what you want in, in either respect. So if you really want that kind of career, you need to, it needs to pervade everything you do in terms of, uh, of how you manage your development. And uh, that's, I think, the real, the recipe for success. And I learned that the hard way to some degree, but now I've, I think I've started to realize that there's, there are recipes for this. I think all of us have figured our own ways of doing it, but a lot, of, there's a lot of common themes for how surgeons can develop uh, into, into both. Yeah, I think one of the things that you've hit on or a couple of people have hit on in different ways is, you know, um, avoiding too much comparing yourself to others. It's, you know, the old line of comparison is the thief of joy really holds true like here because, you know, we do multiple different jobs and we cannot be the best at either one of them basically, is what it sort of comes down to, to some extent. And, and it can be, like you said, it, it can, your ego can take a hit if you're looking at like, you know, your friend that got hired at the same time who also runs a lab and he's got a lot more papers and better papers than you do. Or, you know, that, you know, I only do prostate cancer. So I lose patients all the time to highest, the highest volume prostate cancer surgeons in New York City. That's a little chip to the ego, like every time that happens. And again, like, you can't, you got to just accept the fact that you're balancing in a unique position. You're the best at what you do, but what you do is a balance between different things. It's neither one thing. I mean, what I've learned is basically the only competition I have is with myself. I have no competition with anybody else except for myself. I, you know, write goals at the beginning of the year. This is what I want to accomplish this year. And I compete to just accomplish those amongst myself. Um, I think that's that's one way of looking looking at it, you know, um, which I think is is just who I, the noise. Leave the noise outside. Set your goals. Go after your goals. Stay focused on your goals. And then, yes, it may take a little longer, or or time will will you know not necessarily. We we want that instant gratification as surgeons, and this is not going to get. This is nowhere near instant gratification. Um, to to Ari's point. I mean, rejections come in every day, um, you know, when you're writing your grants, when you're doing your different things. I have learned more from my rejections. And, you know, it's crazy because I remember being in, you know, a medical student or college or resident and hearing all these, you know, the, the folks that are a little bit more advanced in their careers say, I've learned so much from my rejections. Everybody needs rejections, all this stuff, you know, rejections lead to success. And I'm like, these people are crazy. What are they talking about? Like, you know, rejections only to success. Like, I just want papers, I want grants, and you want you got to do this. It's true. I mean, you need the rejections. You need those rejections 
to help you shape your career, to become a better surgeon scientist, to become a better researcher, to become a better clinician. I mean, we learn from our complications during surgery. When something happens during surgery, we analyze it, we assess it, we, we figure out where the, the issue was, and then we try not to happen again. I mean, it's the same way when you're when you're applying for grants, writing your papers, doing your things. And it, you know, it happens to everybody. Like in, in finance, you know, my friends are like, oh, you haven't learned how to trade stocks until you've lost all your money. And I'm like, what? And it's the same, it's the same kind of idea here, you know. Until you've gotten your first rejection, you really haven't learned how to write a grant. Before I forget, any uh, attendees that have specific questions they're interested in, uh, throw them in the chat box. Uh, we'll we'll look through and try to get to them. Chris, uh, actually, Dr. Barberi, there's actually two uh, questions um, that one of them wasn't even sent in, sent over text message to me. But um, the first one, uh, if we can just get jump into that, is uh, what is the uh, process of grant writing? It's kind of a three part question. And uh, how does that funding that you get from the grants uh, contribute to your salary? And you know, how does the um, department, um, you know, kind of negotiate the process of providing um, staff, like you know, grad students and, and postdocs? Um, that was the first one. So the grant writing process. Um, the one thing I would say it is a learned skill that nobody is born with. And the only way you learn it is by other skills of just doing it and getting reps, basically. So the earlier you start the process of trying it and like getting help and getting people to read your grants and, you know, the better you're going to get at it. Um, every grant that you get, no matter how small, increases the chances of you're getting the next one, basically. So I think those are like sort of the general principles that it's never too early to, to get going on those things. Yeah, and then I can, the, the respect to how they negotiate, every institution is different. Uh, and sometimes it's explicit in your salary in terms of what percentage is expected to come from research funds versus what's expected to come from, you know, clinical volume, uh, physicians, etc. But some institutions are a little bit more vague. There's NCI cap, or there's NIH caps for how much money you can have. Some institutions will still give you bonuses on top of that if you meet certain metrics in terms of that. So it's very variable by the institution in terms of what kind of uh, support you'll get. Uh, some of it will just look at it as bonuses, you know, for you and, you know, but there is, it's very, very variable in terms of that. And I would add that the writing of the grant, just like Chris was saying, is very incremental. So if you start off writing a two page grant or a three page grant for a smaller award, you build that data up into your five page grant and then you build it up into your 10 page grant. And it's just constantly writing and rewriting and adding your data to it. Uh, that is really important. So, you know, I've started for our fellows at MSK. I make, we make them all write grants early uh, as just part of their research year, just to have them focus. But that's done really because I, you know, I learned how to write a grant from my first time as a fellow and it was painful. And I wrote a terrible grant the first time, didn't get funded at all. Um, the second one, it was equally as bad. And it wasn't until the third time that I actually, you know, made a little bit of progress. And uh, I think it's just a, it's just not a natural skill. It's just something that, yeah, I mean, some people are really good at writing grants, but it's just like some people are just naturally gifted surgeons. But for most of us, it's just repetition and then just building on it and building on it and building on it and hopefully getting people to help you along the way. And if you can find funded grants in that area, it's really great. So a lot of institutions have a repository of grants that have been funded, uh, you know, a KOA or an AUA award or an ask a YAA or a society if whatever your, uh, you know, uh, whatever your field is interested in. And that's really good as a template just to, to learn how to, how people construct their aims, for example, et cetera. Just to, just to quickly to add to that, um, all the financial part of your grant is what your budget. So if in your budget, you put X percent of my salary, two research assistants, a secretary, uh, whatever, and it gets funded, you get, you know, you get allocation of that money for whichever, wherever you need the help. I mean, the majority of the time, the science is so expensive that you, you don't necessarily always have the ability to put in for, for your, you know, sort of ancillary staff that you absolutely can and, and, and get it. And, you know, a lot of times you definitely need some ancillary staff in your budget, so. But I, I think it's important when you're finding a job to, 
have them disclose very clearly what the expectations are for your salary support recovery, because I think every institute is a little different. Some even have kind of strict strict numbers that you have to hit. So if you're going in saying, I, I would like to have 50% protected time, if I do that, how much do I have to bring in in grants? What percentage of that do I have to recover? And do I have to recover in the first three years or do you get the first three years for free? Um, but those those will make you look like you you're a little more serious uh, when you come in. Uh, if you if you're asking those kinds of questions, then I, I I would take someone like that very seriously that that they they have a, a plan. This is really what they want to do, as opposed to the people who come in saying, um, "Yeah, I want to do research," and you're saying, well, "What kind of money are you looking for?" And they say, "Oh, I can get money to do that." Um, it just not as well well thought through. Yeah, and it's not the kind of thing that you want to sort of um, have the opinion, oh, the, the chairperson seems like a really nice person and supportive. I'll, we'll figure it out over the next couple of years. It's something to, you know, th talk through ahead of time and, and negotiate on in, in a big way, definitely. Okay, great, just, great. Uh, oh, go, go, sorry. Oh, anyway. no, I Go ahead, I was just going to add one little thing. One of the one of the simple things that I've been doing over the years that I think really does help is that it's it's very very daunting to start writing a grant. So to get back to that original question, and and I think so. One of the things that I've been doing and, and just take it to doing uh, is to every time I'm thinking about how I would structure a new project or the next step in a project is I'll write a very short, less than like a one page introductory paragraph that's a couple sentences, significance that's a couple sentences, and then just the line or two that's the aims of what I'm trying to prove. And that way, you know, it, whenever you decide, oh, okay, I've got enough preliminary data that I think I can go ahead and write this grant, you don't feel like you're starting from scratch. And all you have to do is really expand on the points, even if it's bullet points that you've kind of put out for yourself, you, you're starting from a place of, oh, okay, well, I've got the structure already. And so I just have this blank word document that's that's background, significance, aims, hypothesis, you know, hypothesis, aims, um, brief methodology, future directions. And I'd keep it less than a page. And then if you're coming back to write a foundation grant, you just expand it to six pages. If you're coming back to write a bigger grant, you expand that to 12. Um, but I think not starting from scratch just feels so much nicer. Um, if you just, and, and doing something like that, even if it's terrible, just takes you an hour or so. And then, you've, then you're there, then you're already on your way. And I just think that's a nice thing that, that I've taken it. And I make all my fellows do it too. Um, and I think it helps because it's easy to go from there to writing a, a research plan. It's hard to go from nothing to writing a research plan. Thanks, Dr. Ackerman. That's a, that's a great uh, tip right there. Um, it kind of goes right into our uh, second uh, question um, from uh, another uh, audience member. Um, so he kind of asked, uh, what is a, a good startup package? And, and by that, um, specifically, uh, what kind of lab space should you ask, ask for when you're looking at a job? You know, what kind of uh, dollars per year should you ask for? Um, you know, kind of going off the funding question as well. It's tremendously variable uh, to the point where if I went out and looked at three different jobs now that essentially were all about equivalent, they may be structured in so many different ways that it's hard to track that they're actually all equivalent. So it can be really confusing. Um, and it's one of those times where having mentors and having peers to kind of bounce ideas around off is so important because it's really the only time you can sort of, or sometimes it's the only people that can sort of be like, oh wait, that's a red flag there. That doesn't make any sense. Or wow, that's actually a pretty good idea because of this X, Y, and Z. So there's no one right way to do it. Um, everyone does different types of research. If you do, um, you know, if you do health services research, then you need a specific type of sort of uh, equipment or package or, or resources. If you do uh, like Dr. Ackerman does, sort of sequencing of clinical samples, you need different kinds of resources available and different kinds of, um, so it's very variable and it's not like there's one dollar sign or one square footage in terms of the lab amount. It's more sort of being able to think through what you want to do and what you need to do it and being able to put that down on paper in a way that it makes you it makes it clear to the people you're negotiating with that you have your act together and have a grasp of these things, basically. Yeah, and I would, sorry, go ahead. 
it, I mean, I think it goes back to look within what's important to you. What do you want to accomplish? And then write down the what you think you will need to accomplish those. And then just add a little bit more because you're probably not going to get it. So if you add a little bit more, you'll get it, you know, what you probably need in that sense. But everybody is different. You know, what I would want is clearly different. You know, what Chris would want or, you know, somebody else would want when we're looking for the same job. You can have a, a research position open in an academic center and I interview and, you know, let's say Ari interviews and we would ask for completely different things. Um, so, you know, you just need to focus on what your interest is and, and make sure you try to get all the resources you need for, for success. Yeah, I'll just add my two cents before they, the end of the hour. Um, I would over ask and then be resourceful afterward because you'll probably not get everything you want. Um, and again, it totally, like, like Chris was saying, it totally depends on what you do and what your setup is. I joined the same lab that I was a fellow in. So for me, it was less critical that I get tons of startup money because there was already a lot of money for kidney cancer research in my lab, but I needed, you know, a dedicated, you know, I needed some money to do sequencing at the time or whatever, but everyone's got a different setup. And then you just try to find other ways of having, you know, people, work in your in your area in your projects if you don't have enough money to do everything you want but you need help you find collaborators you figure out ways to to involve other people in your projects other labs other you know uh, and there are ways of just being resourceful and again going back to the mentorship you find you talk to people about how they made it work and and what resources they used and i think a lot of us um, you'll find one of the advantages of being a surgeon scientist is there's a lot of people that want to spend time working with you because a lot of people in your field want to spend time, take some time off and, and do research. And some of them can be really great and some of them are really cheap and will even work for free or for a lot, not a lot of money. So those are advantages that you can have as a surgeon and as a mentor to other people. Um, and you can figure out how to make your productivity better by being more resourceful. So over ask and then try to be resourceful are, are there two of the things I would, I would say. I'll add to that it goes back to kind of um, knowing um, the time breakdown and salary support when you're negotiating. If you come in with specifics for this, you're gonna look like a rock star if you come in and, and not just say, I want, you know, I don't know, 250,000 or whatever you want. You say, I need this for my lab. I need, I want a postdoc and a tech or maybe just a, a tech more reasonable, um, kind of depends what your background is and how competitive you are that you can stretch what you ask for. But if you can actually give this, think of this as like the budget for your first grant. If you can write out in detail, I'm gonna need, you know, I need freezers and those are gonna be 10 grand a piece. And if you have this list, you put that sheet on the, on the chairman's desk and say, this is why I need 250 grand, or this is why I need more. This is why I you need less. I need database manager, whatever it is. But I would not, you know, when you're talking, how much should I ask for? If you can't explain exactly how you're going to use that, then you haven't thought it through enough before you're going on these, these interviews. All right. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in, everybody. It looks like we don't have any other questions um, and we're a little bit past the hour. Um, uh, Dr. Barbieri, Ackerman, Coffin, uh, Kianos and uh, Hakimi, you know, if you have uh, any um, any further uh, things you want to address, you know, we can do that now. Or uh, and the other thing I wanted to put out there is, uh, is there any way for the audience to contact you if uh, they have any questions? Uh, is it okay if we uh, share your email addresses? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I want to thank everybody for doing this. Um, it's been great to talk to you guys. I, and I want to echo kind of what everybody was saying earlier that like, I, you know, want everybody in the field and training in the field to know that this is a real viable option for their career. That is quite an awesome career. And it can be done by pretty much anybody who wants it. So don't get discouraged. Okay. All right. <laughs> so that's a wrap. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Guys. Good night. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.